Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peter Caldor, and it's my pleasure on behalf of the City Bible Forum to welcome you to our third in our series of panels in 2011. Our panel today is Sex More Than Biology. Now, my task is a very simple one. I'm just going to introduce our moderator, and he will take over from there. Our moderator is Ed Vaughan. He is a former son of a publican in Darlinghurst and is currently residing in Darlinghurst as the Anglican Minister of St John's. So thank you, Ed, for moderating our discussion and we look forward to uh, what ensues. Okay, thanks, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, friends. Uh, we are really pleased that you are here with us uh, at this, uh, this lunchtime. Uh, let me just say a little bit about myself before we launch into uh, to this subject. I've been living in Ireland, in Dublin, for the past uh, six years. And Ireland, as you might know, is a country that's going through massive changes uh, over the last period of time. And some of those changes have to do with the role of religion in society and with uh, the expression of human sexuality. In fact, some time ago, I was driving in my car listening to the radio and there was uh, an interview about a new TV series that was all about sexuality and changing attitudes. Uh, and in Ireland, pretty much every story begins with the church. And so the interviewer and the producer of this new TV series chatted about the attitudes to sexuality in the old days. And uh, there was lots of laughter about the repressive, old-fashioned, legalistic, unhealthy attitudes that people had to sex in those times, in the past. And there was lots of good jokes about nuns thrown in there as well. And then, after that, we kind of moved on to the subject matter of the program, which was the, the newfound, liberated, 21st century enlightened view of sexuality. And this TV series was going to cover all those things, modern, enlightened, sexual practice, and so on. That characterises now modern Ireland. And so we're going to look at subjects like sexually transmitted diseases, the rise of human trafficking across Europe, uh, especially women forced into sex work against their will, uh, relationship breakdown, especially divorce and the impact of that on suicide rates, sexual dysfunction, the sexualisation of children, the explosion of internet porn. Uh, and that was series one and series two was, was currently under production. Now, surely no one wants to put their hand up for sexual repression, but maybe it's got to be better than genital herpes, you know. So friends, today we have a sub an opportunity to talk about sex. Uh, we have a panel of people with a range of expertise in this area. And let's face it, it's a subject that we're interested in. So here's the deal. My role is simply to, to moderate uh, this discussion. Uh, you have an opportunity to contribute uh, to this discussion by sending uh, an SMS to uh, a number, which will appear here on the screen. And uh, so if you have a question, uh, my role is to pass that on uh, to the panel. And uh, I hope that you do that, because we want you to be very involved in this discussion. Oh, and by the way, you might care to just turn off your mobile phone for the next hour or so, if you can manage to do that. Um, and this is not a debate. Uh, this is not, we're not out to prove that, that some of us are right and some of us are wrong. We want a genuine airing of views and discussion. So to our panel, uh, let me introduce Ian Nesbitt. Uh, Ian is a forensic psychologist whose special area of research is uh, sexual offending through adolescence. Let's uh, welcome Ian. And then we have uh, Pamela Supple. Uh, Pamela is a sex therapist, a relationship counsellor and writer on sexuality. Uh, she's had articles published in Cosmopolitan, Clio, The Australian Magazine and many other places as well. So let's welcome Pamela. And Ian Powell, who is a, a theologian, a minister, and speaker with the City Bible Forum. Thank you, Ian. Let's welcome him. So the question that, uh, that was originally posed for this discussion today was this one. Is, is sex more than biology? Is sex purely for the survival of our species, or does its pleasure point to a higher purpose? And uh, I think we might just move across uh, the way. And Ian, I might ask you first, um, that, that question is, uh, is sex more than biology? Does it point us to, to some kind of higher purpose? How do you see human sexuality functioning? I guess just to have a very simplistic answer to the first point uh, about whether or not um, sex is more than biology, I think it is, clearly it is. Um, and I suppose the reason about it actually has to do with 
to be quite frank, some of my nervousness about appearing on the panel today, which is uh, around the fact that it's very difficult, I don't know if anyone else has noticed this, but it's very difficult to have a bit of a public discussion about human sexuality, um, because it can be a very emotive and um, controversial topic, and it's also one that often produces a great deal more uh, heat than light. So it's, it seems to be very difficult, I think, in our community, particularly at this time, to have a um, any sort of public discourse about human sexuality. And I think that points to the fact that it's not just about biology, that in fact it, uh, it generates very strong feelings, very strong emotions, obviously. Uh, and so I think that um, uh, whilst it's very true that uh, biology plays a huge part in, in uh, uh, regulating our, our sexuality, our sexual behaviour and, and so forth, um, that it's not just about biology. Um, clearly there's more to it than that. So, um, yeah, I think that's what I would say, that uh, clearly there's a, there's a lot more about uh, human sexuality than just simply the, the biological aspects of it. Okay, thank you. And Pamela, how would you answer that question? Sex more than biology? Uh, how, how do you see human sexuality functioning? It's a combination. I, I see it as a combination, as biology as well as um, mental, emotional, physical and spiritual. We are that concept way where I come from. And uh, there are many contributing factors to having a healthy, happy sex life um, besides being the biology. Mm. Okay, great. Ian, what would you say? Sex more than biology? Yeah, it, is, it, it certainly is biological. I mean, I think many people, when they think of sex, they think of you know, um, genitals, orgasms, and now, thanks to advance in science, the hormones that we know are playing their part. It certainly is biological, it certainly is for the procreation of the species. I mean, from a biological point of view, that's its thing. And I've heard some people speak that all the falling in love and all that sort of stuff, that's all froth. Mm. That the fundamental engine is about passing on your genetic code. But while I think it is definitely biological, uh, it is also, um, I mean, as a Christian, I'm, what I'm thinking all the time is what does Jesus say about this? What does, he, what does he believe about it? Not what do I think, because I'm just another mass-produced 21st century Australian. Um, and I think it's clearly about what, the, what he thinks the whole of life is about, which is about uh, relationships of love, um, which is what God is about, the Trinity, Father, Son and Spirit. Way back, as far as you can go, there's been this community of love and sexuality is part of that that drives us into... Um, relationships. Okay. So. so interesting, I think you know, there, there is a fair degree of commonality in, uh, in the views that we would share there. Pamela, if I might come to you and, uh, and ask it, my understanding of, of your work, holistic counselling and sexual therapy and so on, a lot about uh, discovering ways of, of helping human beings express their sexuality in, in very healthy and whole ways. I, I wonder if I might raise with you the issue of pornography. Uh, an area that I know that, that you have done some, some thinking about and some, some writing about. So let me put to the question this way. I assume that your view would be that pornography is a very good thing, uh, a sign of a very healthy, liberated kind of society, uh, something that uh, someone with a sort of robust and open attitude to sex would, would uh, very much um, approve of and, uh, and engage in. Would you say? Um, that's that part of it. But also, too, I think pornography has a lot to answer for. Because I, in my uh, practice, I'm seeing a lot of younger people and a lot of, well, we can't, anybody, any age group really, uh, who have addiction to porn and the impact that this can have on relationships and self and your self-worth and self-esteem. It has a lot to, yeah, it's, it can take its toll. Yeah. So in moderation, anything in moderation, in a happy, healthy, loving relationship that's, um, that two people agree with, anything can go. But if uh, you become very dependent on it, it can become a big problem. Ian, can I throw it to you? Um, I think uh, you expressed some opinions about internet and its relationship with porn and, and so on. You have some comments on that? Yeah, but I think it's probably important that we back up a little bit before okay. we go too far down that track. You know, when we're talking about pornography, it's such a bucket term, yeah. uh, and clearly there's a, a range of pornography out there. And certainly, I know that, say, for the example, the adult industry would be very keen to, um, 
to delineate between sort of non-violent erotica or um, what they what may be called soft porn or something down one end of the spectrum, and then obviously quite hardcore porn or, or fetish porn or whatever, and very extreme violent sort of stuff up to the other end of the spectrum. So if we're going to talk about the, the harm of pornography, it's probably um, you know, important that we, talk, we, we make it a bit clearer just what sort of pornography we're talking about. Um, I guess my particular views on it is that I, I, what I see is, um, uh, I don't think it's particularly controversial, but um, it's certainly the case that uh, young people have a lot more access to the sort of pornography that you might see on DVDs or on the internet at the moment, um, you know, ha having um, uh, mainly sort of male-centred pornography um, with men having sex with lots of women um, uh, at once, etc., etc. the sorts of things you, you'd see. I'm talking about um, you know, people having sex uh, together um, and mainly from, from it being quite from a male perspective. Um, I think that young people uh, have a lot more access to that sort of pornography now than ever before, obviously through uh, our improved um, uh, media techniques and um, communication devices, etc. Uh, and I guess what I, from my personal uh, um, observations of that is that's not such a great thing for our community. Um, the thing that, that I have been involved in quite a lot, as I said, uh, or as you said in your introduction, is about um, research, particularly to do with adolescents who commit sexual offences, so not so much the area that I've been working with adolescents who perpetrate sexual offences rather than being victims of sexual offences. But very, very often I see that, um, uh, you know, particularly young, young guys, uh, they hit puberty around about, you know, um, 12 or 13 or whatever and become very interested in sex, obviously look at a lot of porn and stuff um, via, you know, the internet or, or whatever, and then become very interested to know more about it and will often um, uh, uh, sexually exploit the vulnerability of a child that um, may be sometimes uh, a younger sister or very often a cousin or a friend of um, the, the family or something like that. So I guess the, the concern that I have is that with the, um, with the greater availability of um, lots of images and lots of um, examples of people having fairly, uh, or having sex which is really devoid of any sort of emotional commitment or any sort of um, you know, relational sort of aspect at all, uh, I guess what I see is a, a real danger that we're going to see more and more of um, uh, young people who aren't able to sort of uh, make the same sort of discernments about uh, the reality of what's being depicted um, and then trying that out themselves uh, with the, the obvious um, uh, consequences for the, for the young victims. Pamela, can I ask you, have you, is that the sort of thing that you're seeing in your practice, uh, especially with regard to the internet and, and pornography? Is that borne out in your experience? Yeah, um, we've got to remember that pornography is acting and it's purely acting. They're getting paid to do this, <laughs> and uh, they have a lot of uh, help with, you know, Viagra pills, drugs, you know. So it's 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 very it's, it's, fantasy, a, big, it's, it's yeah. a big money spinner. So um, a lot of younger people don't realise that, and uh, I'm seeing that it, the younger generation, from say like adolescents through to younger men now in their 20s uh, have grown up on porn. They get it on their phones and they enter relationships and they have, they think to make love with their partner is to act like a porn star, mm. is to have sex like a porn star. This is the kind of model of, if, of how you that should they're act. Being, they're basing this on. Not everybody, but a lot are. And I have younger people or even older people come in and say, well, we can do the 110 positions. We can do this and be really good at doing, I'm going to say, giving a head job and all of this sort of thing. But you know what? There's no connection. We're not connecting. The relationship is kind of missing. The relationship. We're not communicating. It's, it's empty. Empty, yeah. Pamela, someone's asked the question, is, is there a, uh, you know, as one might see a pathway from, you know, soft drugs to hard drugs that some people, you know, say, is there, is there a kind of pathway in terms of porn and porn addiction that people start off with something that might be relatively innocuous and then move on to, do you notice that kind of thing? Uh, yeah, that can happen, but I think depending too, I've spoken to people who are addicted to porn and they, had, they can't really remember what they were looking at five minutes ago. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They get in a zone and they just, it's, it's, it's a heightened state of awareness they get into and they can lose hours. Okay. 
Ian, can I throw to you, because you were a chaplain in a boys' school uh, for a number of years, and I don't know, what, what did you see in terms of the way that people, adolescents, expressed sexuality? Did you see a lot of you know, healthy expressions of adolescent sexuality or something else, perhaps? Uh, just, you know, in it, just trying to nutshell it uh, on this particular topic, I, one of the questions that used to get asked is about should there be sexual education, which is kind of a dumb question because everyone has a sex education. Um, our culture educates you about sex. The yeah. scary thing is, I think, for our culture is that a lot of it comes from Hollywood, and there's some beautiful uh, love stories in Hollywood, but I remember probably 15, 20 years ago, the Vatican asked Hollywood to have more scenes of sex between husbands and wives because it was something like 97% of times when you either saw couples groping with each other, because you have to see it now, you can't just imagine it, um, or it was implied that they had, they were not married. <coughs> and... Um, uh, so the kids are being thoroughly educated. We used to do a, a, a little bit, of, we had a, I had a very helpful discussion that I'd found on a video about pornography. It's hard to get informed, sensible discussions, which used to be part of Year 10. But then as the net became more and more common, I just realised that boys in Year 7 were a mixture between beautifully naive kids who just were just children and kids who had watched the sort of pornography that it was simply, I would have thought, almost impossible for me to get. Um, some years back. So yeah. we moved the movie further and further down because we just realised by the time we're talking to them in year 10, they have watched hundreds of hours of quite alarming um, porn and it just shapes their expectation. It shapes the way they feel about women. I used to joke with them about some of the guys have beautiful pictures of women on, the, on their folders and I'd say, there's no point having it, man, because you're never going to marry anyone like that. So you're going to be you're going to be disappointed. It's great for their self-esteem. Yeah, because yeah. I said, well, a loser <laughs> like you. Isn't That's it. Going to yeah, get, I mean, <laughs> me on the other hand. <laughs> but, no, but I mean, I said because the thing is, she doesn't exist. Yeah, she hasn't just been airbrushed as they used point. to be. This is all. So this I said, I said, you, what you what you've got is a picture of a beautiful woman. One, she doesn't exist, and two, you will never marry her. So it means that when you deal with the reality yes, of sexuality, it'll be bitterly disappointing. Mm. Ian, can I ask? Uh, you, this question, it seems to me a lot of your work actually kind of links uh, human darkness, if you like, and, and sexuality. Um, I don't know, would you say as a society we're, we're getting better at sex? We're getting worse? Uh, we talk a lot about sexuality and we want to be open and all those sorts of things, but this, you know, as in my introduction, there seem to be an enormous amount of problems uh, around sexuality. Yeah, um, well, I think uh, Pamela's point is probably a, a good illustration of that. You, know, you might get better at technique or something, but it's, um, you know, people, I think, very often lacking the, the, the connectedness, the human dimension, uh, you know, the, the spiritual aspect of sexuality. So, um, yeah, I think uh, perhaps uh, young people today um, know heaps more about sex or they've seen a lot of different kinds of variations of different sorts of couplings or, or whatever, but... Um, they may not be equipped to actually uh, connect uh, relationally with other people. So um, I don't think, uh, I wouldn't take that as improvement, I don't think. No. And Pam, please. I was going to just mention there too, technique is what you see on porn or on a movie is totally acting. So when we're in a relationship, just because what worked in one relationship is not going to work in the next relationship. Yeah, right, because mm. the people are different. Might, can I just say it might not all be acting? I mean, particularly if you're at the Defence Force Academy in Australia, I think um, apparently from the, the Herald this morning, you might actually be seeing real, quite actual sex. But oh, true, mm. yeah, yeah, but I'm... Um, yeah, they're... they're <laughs> Pamela, what do you do when someone comes, I guess, and, and uh, the real issue, as you understand it, or maybe even as they present it, is a, how do you help people have better relationship what, what do you do? Well, we've got to introduce communicating. Communication. Communication, talking. You know, how else are we going to... I, I'm seeing that people are SMSing, they're emailing, they're talking on the phone, it's, uh, they're hooking up through Facebook. It's this void I'm seeing of actual person to person. And a, when a lot of talk, but not a lot of communication. Yeah, and you don't see re you don't see body language, you don't uh, see uh -huh. expressions. Uh -huh. You get capital letters, or you get an, an energy, <laughs> and it's just like whoa. <laughs> and then if you were talking to them in, in face to face, 
you would actually be able to say, well, hang on, let's, I'm sensing, you know, by your reaction here, and, or let's talk about this. We, I mean, maybe this is impossible to say, but are, are we getting worse at relationships? Are we losing something about relationships in our, our society? Relationships, no matter whether it's a couple re relationship or whether it's, it's family, whether it's friends, whether it's groups, um, there's always dynamics and we have to look at the dynamics. Um, but I, I really would like communicating to be just be brought more back in person to person. Yeah, right, okay. Yeah. Okay. In, oh, go, I was just gonna say, if you take like divorce rates as some sort of proxy for our, whether or not um, you know, we're our getting better or worse. to relate. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, you have to say, well, no, um, that, yeah, more and more uh, people that uh, decide to get married and then deciding that they don't wanna be married. So. And it, it's easy to get divorced. Yeah, to absolutely. leave a relationship. Oh, this is too hard. So I'm just out of it. Oh, mm. I don't. I don't want to talk about you. You annoy me. <laughs> <laughs> there was an, a friend, a colleague from work, sent me a um, an article from the Herald, uh, responding or interacting with that movie, No Strings Attached, Friends with Benefits. That sort of yes, um, I saw that thing. Yeah. And it was interesting because they had two sexologists they were bouncing between. Um, but one of them towards the end said, you know, what happens with people is that they have sex and you know, they go for and then they realise they, they talk and then we think, but I don't, I don't even really like you. No. Mm -hmm. And I thought what was interesting was, obviously when I became a Christian, one of the things, one of the reasons I was resistant to it was because I knew if I became a Christian, there would be no sex until I got married, which was, seemed like a long way off and it was. And so I, that seemed to be to be an absurdity and a cruelty at the time, uh, sitting on the outside. <laughs> <coughs> but then it was just interesting that it was, it just, it's a different universe that, that that quite otherwise wise person was saying that this is kind of normal, that people will drink a bit, you know, link up, have sex, then get to know each other. Whereas the, the, the position you finish up with, you know, if, if the Bible is taken seriously is, um, you have sex with someone, you, you give yourself to someone physically, completely when you have given yourself to them fully in, in every other area. Otherwise you've got a sort of body language that's lying that says I give and so it's just I think it's intriguing that this on this communication thing that the assumption was that, well no you have sex and then you think, Oh God, I don't like I don't, I don't know you. Now then I get to know you I don't yeah. like you. I think and you're a, you're, you know, a Christian here, a Christian spokesman. <coughs> I assume you're kind of on the side of sort of sexual repression and Absolutely. So, you know, you're yeah. <laughs> The church and Christians have a long history of you know, yep. being negative about sex and so on, so I assume that's, that's your kind of contribution to this, uh, <laughs> this debate? Yes, don't. Okay. <laughs> yeah, except yeah. I suppose you've got to have children. Yeah, right, um, okay. But no, don't I mean, enjoy yeah. it. Don't, don't enjoy it. Well, I, I mean, I was, I was surprised when I became a Christian um, to then discover what the Bible does say about sex. And what does how, it say? What's, well, what's I mean, the the, when it talks about the creation of mankind, tells the story twice from different angles. In... Chapter 1 of Genesis, the only thing it says in the verse about the creation is God made us. He made us in the image of, of God. And so there's something about humans that the other 65 books will spell out that's like God. And he makes us male and female. Mm. Now, it, it would be intriguing. Of, uh, three things you can say about humankind. They're the, only, they're the three main things the Bible introduced you to. And I think, interesting, now we know that everyone except two cells in my body, two types of cells, are male. You could tell from any pancreas, liver, skin, um, that m there was a time in the late 70s, early 80s where we began to think of sexuality as just the genitals, men and females. Now, thank goodness, we've gone beyond that. But the Bible says, no, it's, it's deep. It's deep in the very hardware of what God has made. I'm a male. I'm also, I'm human, but I will see the world that way. And then it's the first command God gives in Genesis is be fruitful. And now they might have known about fallopian tubes and other stuff like that, but they knew the way, it's a command to have sex. So if you can't picture Adam and Eve as it were in the garden, rolling around in the grass, lost in the thrill of sexual ecstasy, um, you've got no idea what the Bible's talking about. Because if they didn't have sex in the garden, that would have been sinful. Okay. And so it's, it's very positive, but it's, it's got guidelines around it to where, where God, who made it, thinks it works. Okay. Pamela, can I ask you, you would see yourself as a holistic counsellor? Mm -hmm. and, yes. And so I... My understanding is that you would see that the sort of sexual therapy that you do includes physical, emotional, and at some level spiritual uh, aspects as well. Could you say something about that? Um, yes. When people come to see me, um, it, I have to find out, you know, their belief structure 
uh, for where they're coming from, from a spiritual perspective. Yeah. Um, and I, I see people from all cultures, all belief structures, and I have to work with that. Um, because what might be acceptable for one mm. lot of people is not really acceptable for others. And um, then, that, that aside, I, tr I, if you've been married for 20 years, or, or 10 years, or 15, whatever, sex changes. It's like anything. We change. Our relationships change. Everything changes. And relationships and sex need to be worked at. Mm. And you need to be able to connect. And if you can connect with your partner, and that doesn't mean every time you have make love that you're going to have a long love-making session. But if you can learn to communicate, look at each other, find out what each other likes, learn something new about each other every week, every day, through communicating, you might find out really wonderful things about each other, um, that you can connect with them. And that can be quite a spiritual experience. A kind of soul connection in some It's way. a soul connection. And when you can make love with a partner and connect on that level, it can be beautiful. Mm -hmm. Can I just remind you folks that if you want to SMS uh, questions, there's the number up there, and we're very happy to receive them and I'll feed them on to the panel. Ian, can I ask you, in the light of that, often what you're dealing with is very young people who engage in very, you know, sometimes violent, you know, um, the word I, comes to mind is kind of disruptive, spiritually perhaps, kind of things. How, how, what is the impact of this on young people and, and how do they work through those mm. kind of things? Mm. Well, the impact, obviously, at a number of different levels. Um, I mean, just at the sort of outermost level, um, uh, having a criminal record for a sexual offence isn't going to be good on your CV. So, um, it obviously, has very big, uh, very large impact on, on their future lives. Um, so, and that's that's a real problem and a particular concern of mine. But I think uh, I think also um, at, at a more personal level, I, I guess the the sad thing is I think uh, young people basically selling themselves short when it comes to to the possibilities for sexuality. Um, you know, it, I guess it's, uh, I, I think as, as Pamela said, the, the people that tend to have uh, the mo or report the most happy um, uh, sex lives are those that are involved in some sort of uh, uh, long-term trusting relationship. Um, uh, and unfortunately, that's, um, that's, there's no other way to, to develop that except by very, very hard work over a number of years. Um, but the, the model that uh, most people are being sold at the moment, most young people particularly, um, is, is not that at all. It's, it's very much about something very, very quick. I think uh, the average uh, porn DVD or certainly ones on the internet, I think go for like eight minutes or something like that. So um, the idea of sexuality that is broadly being marketed is uh, a, very, um, a very quick encounter. Um, so uh, unfortunately, I think if, if young people just have that idea of sexuality and get sold that and uh, don't understand that there's actually benefits for, for not going down that road, then um, I think uh, not only do they, they miss out um, initially, but I guess uh, there's obvious, uh, I mean, basically if you've got a young 14-year-old who is uh, developing a sexual response cycle where he watches porn and masturbates and then ejaculates very, very quickly, um, that's not the sort of thing which is going to set him up for really great uh, lovemaking sort of long term. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, there's a whole lot of problems, I, I think, from that point of view. So I guess, it's not, in some ways, I think it's not so much that we are... Um, uh, I, I don't think it's we've got to be too sexy in our society. I think we're just not sexy enough. It's like we just... It's bizarre, isn't it? Yeah. It's, in such a sexualised culture, somehow we still are far from the mark and miss it. Yeah. Would, it's, would you uh, be yeah. experiencing this, Pamela? Would you agree with that, Connor? Yeah. Um, just, Just... When you mentioned then young men ejaculating quickly, I have a lot of people coming in with premature ejaculation mm. because they've learnt to get it over and done with quickly mm. by porn or it at home under the bed clothes quickly and not learning to uh, not learning techniques or learning to yeah um, be able to maintain. To enjoy the experience, enjoy it's got to be done experience. quickly and yeah. mm -hmm. like the, the, the sexual equivalent of fast food, in a sense. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's probably important to say as well, I think one of the other things that I observe that I'm concerned about also is that actually it's not just young guys that are developing these expectations now as well, mm -hmm. but for a lot of girls, they, that's, 
if they see that, like, increasingly young girls are seeing quite a lot of porn also, but that they think that that's what sex is about also. Pamela, I think you made that remark earlier in our conversation that you were seeing an increasing um, uh, link between women watching porn or you know, young girls or whatever. And a lot of women addicted to sex, porn addiction, sex. Really? Yeah, it's not just men. Okay. It's both, okay. both men and women. Okay. Actually, if I get back to one of the points Please. I think you raised earlier on about um, whether or not, uh, you know, w with uh, porn addiction or this idea of porn addiction, whether it's like other drugs, for example, you might start off on soft drugs or whatever yeah, yeah. And, and go on. Unfortunately, the, there does seem to be quite a lot of that that's, that's reported. I do some supervision for someone uh, that counsellors um, uh, men that have sexually offended. Uh, and particularly um, guys that have been uh, prosecuted for having internet porn, uh, sorry, child porn from the internet. So um, in a particular case, I was doing some supervision for a counsellor the other day, but the, the client that she was seeing, um, a heterosexual male, um, uh, not very good at maintaining relationships with women, was doing quite a lot of porn on, on the computer, but found that um, when he was, he was downloading quite a lot of images, and he wasn't actually initially seeking uh, child porn, but amongst the collection of images that he had downloaded, there were some uh, that were child porn, and that, you know, he sort of looked at that, and that actually did something for him that he wasn't expecting, and then later on, he was actually started to look for those particular kind of images. And then finally, um, he was, you know, um, the, the police caught up with him uh, okay. via some sort of um, internet sort of uh, tracking or whatever, and he was, he was prosecuted for that, um, and. Uh, it was end up seeing um, the, the person that I'm, that I'm supervising. So um, I think it's often the case that people... Uh, the other thing I know that we're seeing also, particularly with, with men that um, are doing uh, child porn at the moment, is it's the sort of people that we're seeing who are being prosecuted for having child porn is not... Um, it's a, it's a, um, in some ways it's net widening in, in some cases you could say, in that the sort of people that we're seeing are not just the sort of um, people that are not good at relating to women or not good at relating to adults or you know the kind of stereotype of the guy in the, the raincoat or whatever that's, that's functioning at a fairly low level. Increasingly we're seeing people that function actually at very, very high levels, um, people that are quite successful in their particular areas and would appear to have their lives together in many ways. Um, but then, in fact, court when their computer uh, hard drive goes in for maintenance, or someone at work, mm -hmm. someone does some some sort of search or whatever, yeah. discovers they've actually been caught with, with child porn. So I think there is um, uh, there does seem to be a bit of trajectory that that uh, we're observing where um, people go from uh, looking at uh, uh, um, uh, consenting porn or, or, or whatever you might want to call it, then to actually um, progressing onto yeah there. more extreme porn, porn and sometimes child porn. Ian, I've got a question that someone sent in for you, Ian Powell. Um, the question is that uh, you know you're saying that sex is for marriage, but now you know, we have very good contraception. You know, we, there have technological ways of you know avoiding uh, birth and so on. So does that kind of make some of the things in the Bible out of date? Are these just very old-fashioned? You know, from another culture, another time, another civilization, fairly irrelevant yeah. to the way that we operate in our culture now. Uh, that's a good question. They are old-fashioned, which is to say nothing. <laughs> yeah. So is loving a neighbour. You know, you said when people often will use a phrase like "old-fashioned" as if they've said something. Yeah. Um, it's been around for a while. Yeah, it's old-fashioned. Hopeless yeah. oxygen. But um, <laughs> but I, there's no doubt. I mean, I, as I understand it, the birth pill is one of the greatest changes in people's relation to sex because now one of the great fears people had was you know sex outside of marriage. You could have a child, and da, 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 da. so I think it is hard for us to imagine what it's like been like for most of human history and most cultures that sex was always inseparably tied up with the possibility of being fruitful mm. uh, even if you didn't want it and I think the Bible's um, understanding of why sexual intercourse belongs when you have given yourself wholly to this other person um, stands or falls without children so I've had friends who've got married who know they're not going to have children right perfectly valid marriage yeah um, but it's it in terms of just the relationship all the stuff that we've discovered in the last 20 years of the various hormones that get released when you fall in love, when you kiss, uh, particularly, is it, is it oxy, not oxy Oxy Oxytoxin. Oxytoxin. Where's more than two syllables are a problem. <laughs> yeah, but you yeah. know, that, that when, when people have a sexual orgasm, um, there's a, a large release of this hormone. There's another one that men have as well, that also related. It's the same hormone that, according to the scientists, is released when a woman breastfeeds her baby. It's an attachment hormone, part of what it does. Okay. 
So that the idea the of... love drug. Yeah, so the idea the of, <laughs> of casual sex is... I think the Bible's always been right, that it's actually... You can have casual sex, but it's damaging. Um, Destructive so, in some Yeah, way. Just, and so that the, the Bible has got this discussion, because the early Christians... The idea of what the Bible said about not having sex till you got married, and then once you're married, being faithful, you know, monogamous in that relationship, um, and rejoicing in that. The commands of the Bible are to, re- you know, to, to live it up. Mm. Uh, in the middle of the Bible is this seal section, the Song of Solomon, geographically, and it's, a, it's an erotic poem for eight chapters, where the man and the wife rejoice in each other's physicality. They're not saying, you have a beautiful mind, let's play chess. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> The description is erotic. He talks about... Oh, and, well, but, that you know, could work for some people. It could. <laughs> that could work Doesn't for some It doesn't for me, but people. might for some. Uh, <laughs> diversity is wonderful. So I, just think, so I don't think it, I don't think it makes any difference, although because I think the concern of the Bible is relationships, relationships. and sex is to drive you out of yourself into a, a loving, passionate relationship, and it's, God seems to have the idea that that should be within a, a genuine commitment where the person knows that I will be loved... Okay. No matter what comes. Someone else asked a question about masturbation, but I assume you would answer along similar lines. But I'm going to move on to Pamela because I've got a question for you. Someone just asks um, about polygamy, and uh, I know that you've written on this subject, uh, and asks uh, your, your views uh, about that. And do you see that as a helpful expression of human sexuality, or do you have any issues with it? How, how do you feel about that? My personal views are... It's... Look, they're... Who am I to say? What am I? Who who am I to tell people what to do? And I have people come in, who are who like to have more than one partner in their relationship, and um, I have to work with that. Right. I don't think it's it's not my point here to come across with my point of view and how okay. I feel about that. Okay. Fine. And uh, they're there because they, if it's a consensual relationship between how many people, whoever. I have to work with that. Right. Okay. So it's, yeah, it's just part of... It's part of being a sex therapist. Yeah, sure. Okay. And being open and honest and people can come in and actually be safe yeah, okay. about what they want to talk about. Okay. Uh, we are reasonably close to, uh, to time. We have about five minutes to, to, to go. So I'm just going to ask uh, for some concluding comments. And uh, Ian, we started with you, and so I'll come back to you. Um, as you kind of reflect... In, from your work and your experiences about human sexuality, um, just you know, how do you see us as human beings operating in, as, as sexual people? Um, h- how do you see us? What, what, what are the key factors of that? Um, I think overall, I'd say, I mean, if I take a societal or cultural sort of point of view, um, I, think, I think as a community or as a group of people, I think we tend to be selling ourselves short when it comes to sexuality. I don't, I don't think that... Um, uh, I think that we can enjoy sexual relationships a great deal more than most people are, um, and I think, unfortunately, uh, the I guess the, the dominant kind of um, image of, of sexuality uh, um, that's being marketed at the moment. I guess it's also a problem. I think that we've tended to commodify sex. I think that's that's all, all sorts of problems associated with it as well. But I think, uh, but by and large, the, the the message that we're being sold about sex, um, I think, sells it sells it really short and. Um, uh, as I said, my concern is that a lot of young people are kind of missing out on, on uh, stuff that they could have. They're being sold something which actually isn't all that valuable, but they actually are being told it's very, very valuable. You know, lots of experience is a good thing, or multiple partners is a good thing, or, or whatever. Um, and actually, um, I don't think that's the case. Yeah, right. Okay. And Pamela, for you, I mean, you're someone who works in the area of, of sexual therapy. We live in an incredibly sexualized culture, but some of the things that we seem to have been agreeing on, on today seem to be suggesting that despite this sort of background of, of sexualisation, there are some significant issues for us, and maybe we're not enjoying sex as much as we should be. How do you see it? I think sex is very subjective. There are people that come into me and they just don't like it. They don't want it. But, and there are some people who come in and can't get enough of it. And I think in relationships, you're going to always have a differences of libido. Sure. You can't expect it to be perfect all the time. Mm-hmm. But I think you can work at this. And hopefully, as a sex therapist, I can, that's, my, that's what I do. I help people come to a, a place in their relationship or for themselves that they are okay with the type of sex that they are having. 
And some people don't have intercourse in their relationship. Mm -hmm. They have many other forms of sex, but they don't actually have intercourse. They've chosen to not be intimate in that way. Yeah. Have in, yeah so you've got to work with that. Mm -hmm. Again, it's what's consensual between two adults. Mm. And, and as I understand you, Pamela, a lot of the stuff that you're talking about is you know, partly about sex, but a lot to do with the relationship between people. That's the key. Whether it's in a singledom or whether it's a couple, yeah. yeah. That's how we relate. It's about relationships, yeah. 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 And our sense of self. Ah. Okay. Ian, for you, any, any final comments that you want to make about uh, just the... As you as a Christian, how you see sexuality and how you see its role in our culture and society? Damn. Well, I, I'm really glad that God chose to make us sexual. Hmm. Um, it, it, it enriches the whole of life. Uh, it is um, sexual intimacy. Um, obviously, I think that God knows what he's on about. The best place for it is, is within a permanent um, uh, relationship. I think it is one of the finest, most wonderful experiences available to human life, and I thank God for it. It also makes life really messy and complicated yeah. and difficult. Yeah. So um, amongst humans, greatest joys and hopes and longings are in the area of sexuality, and amongst a lot of our greatest regrets and fears and, and disappointments and pain is that. Yeah. And I, I, I think my feeling for our society is, I'm sure we've made a lot of progress, a lot of understanding about things we didn't understand uh, in the past, and that's been a good thing. But I, I feel sad, I think, for our culture because it thinks it's sexually liberated and it thinks it's got a high view of sex. But in com and it thinks it knows what the Bible says and it hasn't got the faintest clue. Yeah. Um, and I, I just think that the, the, the model that Jesus teaches and that the Bible has is so um, unheard in our culture and so wonderfully positive and it works. And I just, I think it's kind of sad that our culture talks a lot about it. but doesn't listen to people that it probably should, I think. Okay, thank you. Friends, I want to thank you very much for coming along today. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for the SMSs that you, uh, that you sent. Uh, and of course, on your behalf, I want to thank Ian and Pamela and Ian for their participation. We give them a, a round of applause, please.